I just have one item at the top. Uh, Secretary uh, Kerry arrived in Beijing, China to take part in the sixth U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue and the fifth U.S.-China High-Level Consultation on People-to-People -people Exchange. He had a small working dinner with State Councilor Yang Jichur, uh, and tomorrow the SNED and the CPE will begin. As you know, the SNED is a central forum for the United States and China to take stock of progress, set new goals for the relationship, develop habits of cooperation in areas of mutual interest, and to manage areas of difference through candid, high-level discussions. The SNED remains an important component of our efforts with China to build relations between our countries, and the CPE provides a high-level forum for government, civil society, and private sector representatives to discuss cooperation in various areas of common interests. Uh, Secretary Kerry uh, will also co-chair this year's forum and call for closer and expanded people-to-people -people ties. With that, Matt, let's get to what's on your mind. Um, let's start with uh, Israel. Okay. Uh, as you are aware, no doubt, the Israeli Air Force is conducting operations over in uh, uh, Gaza right now. Um, and I'm wondering um, what, you, uh, what you make of that. Uh, also, the rockets have been are being fired into southern Israel. Uh, Tel Aviv was, there were si air raid sirens in Tel Aviv. What's your take on, on the situation? Do you believe that this is, <coughs> excuse me, the kind of restraint that you've been calling for from both sides for the past uh, week or so? Well, we strongly condemn uh, the continuing rocket fire into Israel and the deliberate targeting by t of civilians by terrorist organizations in Gaza. Uh, no country uh, can accept rocket fire aimed at civilians, and we certainly support Israel's right to defend itself against these attacks. Uh, we appreciate, uh, we're concerned, of course, about the safety and security of civilians, as you mentioned. I know there's been uh, a range of uh, reported attacks uh, that have gone uh, directly. Um, on both sides, uh, the residents of southern Israel uh, who are forced to live under rocket fire in their homes, the civilians in Gaza uh, who are subjected to the conflict because of Hamas's actions. Uh, the Secretary uh, spoke with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu Friday and again on Sunday. Uh, he's been in regular contact. Let me just make sure he hasn't had a call today as well. Uh, not today, but he's been in close contact. Um, and uh, he's reiterated uh, our concern, as our teams have on the ground, to both sides about the need to de-escalate uh, the tensions on the ground. Uh, we've also, he's also been in touch with leaders in the region about our concerns about what's happening in the ground. So in terms of um, what's happening specifically today, uh, you know, our hope is certainly that uh, by sending a strong message uh, that Israel will be able to deter uh, some of the uh, attacks that have been happening uh, that have been coming at them uh, from Gaza. And again, I would just reiterate our view that they have the right to defend themselves. But do you believe that this is, that the Israeli actions are, quote, sending a strong message? That's what you're referring to? Uh, sending, uh, well, I, I believe I'm referring the to the calls uh, this morning. I'm not referring to specific airstrikes, but I would reiterate just that they're defending themselves. They have uh, a rocket right, attacks just, coming into their own country. Right, the, I don't have an ulterior no, motive here. I'm just trying Keep to figure ahead. out when you say that <clears throat> you think that Israel's sending a strong message, but by sending a strong message, Israel will be able to deter future rocket attacks from Gaza. Is what the Israelis are doing now, do you consider that to be sending a strong message or is it something else? I'm not referring to specific else? action. I'm referring to... Uh, their uh, statements that they are prepared, uh, they're preparing themselves uh, to uh, respond to the attack. Certainly our preference, uh, which is what the Secretary and others have been conveying to both sides, is to de-escalate detentions, to, uh, to bring an end to the violence. But uh, we certainly uh, believe they have the right to defend themselves as well. They've authorized, the, 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 the government's authorized to call up 40,000 troops, which would appear to be a, paving the way for a potential ground operation. Is that something that um, you would oppose? That's something that you would think is fully within Israel's right to do? What, 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 what's your, well, what are your thoughts on that? we're not going to get ahead of where we are. I'm not going to get ahead of where we are now. I would remind you that just this past weekend, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu called for uh, acting responsibly, called for all sides acting responsibly. Uh, we're continuing to convey the need to de-escalate to both sides. Uh, again, uh, 
It is not a surprise that they are taking steps to prepare themselves, but certainly our preference is to de-escalate the situation on the ground. Do you, do you believe that all sides are acting responsibly? Well, I think at the cer moment? certainly we've been calling for de-escalation because obviously the rocket attacks coming into Gaza, the recent violence so on the ground. No. Correct. On the Palestinian side, they're not, or on the Hamas side, uh, they're not, not acting responsibly. We correct? think all sides, is, all sides should act responsibly. All sides should take steps to de-escalate. But again, it's important to note where the rocket attacks are coming from. But obviously, there are a lot of uh, circumstances I, on the I, ground now. As I, we know. I, I understand that. I'm just trying to get at. I'm trying to find out what the administration's position is on whether the sides are resp a acting responsibly, whether they are. Um, showing the kind of restraint that you think is necessary to de-escalate the situation or not. And it's very possible that one side is and the other side isn't, or that that's your opinion. But I'm just trying to find out if uh, what, is the what, what does the administration believe? Is it, are its calls for restraint being heeded by one side, both sides, or neither side? I'm not going to get into that level of specificity, Matt, other than to say that we're conveying through diplomatic channels the importance to both sides of acting responsibly and, and with restraint. Okay, and then my last one is you said that the Secretary had been, in addition to calling uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu on Friday and su Sunday, mm -hmm. right? uh, Correct. that he had Friday also been Sunday. in touch with re leaders in the region to pass along the same message, I guess. Could mm -hmm. you be more specific about who Well, what leaders? I'm specifically, let me see if there are more specific calls to read out for you. Uh, what I'm referring to is any uh, leader in the region, any countries in the region that can send a strong message to Hamas as well. But that would be so, like the Egyptians, the Saudis, the who, who, Turks. Uh, the that's correct. Um, those are all applicable. Um, I don't have any more specifics to read out for you, though. Well, what, about the what about <coughs> Palestinian President Abbas sending a strong message to Hamas? I mean, you are recognizing his government, of which Hamas is a part. I mean, doesn't he bear some responsibility for reigning in Hamas? We don't recognize governments. Hamas is not a part of the technocratic government. We certainly it's expect. Let government me finish. We certainly expect President Abbas to do everything in his power uh, to prevent rocket attacks and to condemn violence. And he has made a range of those calls. But we're conveying the same uh, a message to to uh, him as well about the need to exercise uh, restraint and de-escalate the circumstances. But situation do you think that he bears some responsibility here? I mean. I just, I, it's like, at one point, yes, it was a conflict between just the U.S. and Hamas, and, and Abbas had no real kind of skin in the game because it was between these two parties, even though it was affecting the Palestinian people directly. But now he's part of a unity government and has some influence with Hamas now, wouldn't you say? Well, we have no evidence that Hamas plays any role in the interim technocratic government. And as far as we know... Uh, there have also been no steps taken uh, for the implementation of the reconciliation. And obviously, as I mentioned yesterday, given uh, the situation on the ground, it's difficult to see how the reconciliation process can move forward in the current atmosphere. I think, yes, we want President Abbas to do everything in his power to prevent rocket attacks and to condemn violence. But I would remind you, as you know, uh, Hamas control, uh, continues to control Gaza. The Palestinian Authority security forces only operate in the West Bank and don't operate in Gaza. So uh, there are certainly limitations to what is possible, though we want him to do everything in his power uh, to prevent uh, and condemn these type of uh, attacks. The meaning of the message, please. So you think that all Israel is doing is sending a strong deterrent message, and that's all there is. And that remains within the accepted uh, pro proportion, pro proportion, whatever, proportion. I don't think that's what I stated, Said. There's obviously a range of circumstances on the ground right now, as you all know. There are the uh, unfortunate uh, recent uh, event, uh, uh, deaths of the three teenagers. There right. are, uh, there is the kidnapping and then the, the beating of the of the other right. teenager. There, are, there is violence and back and forth. I don't have to repeat for you. You okay. know exactly what's happening I, on the ground. You don't, you don't have to repeat for me, but you, you, f you feel that uh, sort of the Israeli air raid, like maybe hundreds of them so far this day, uh, are proportionate to the rockets? Like That's no. I wouldn't uh, validate the accuracy okay, of that well, number, but I would. I would say, say I would say, say that yeah. I don't think any country would be expected yeah. to okay. allow rockets to come in and uh, threaten the lives uh, and health and well-being of the citizens in their country. You, and Israel has the right to defend themselves. Okay. Do you believe that the Palestinians in Gaza have the right to defend themselves? 
I, I think I'm not sure what you're getting at. Saeed. I'm asking you, do they have the right to defend themselves against What are you specifically aggression? referring to? Is there a specific event or do a specific have, occurrence? Do they have the right to respond to Israeli rocketing and bombing their, their homes, their houses, We're their talking areas, about their attacks schools. from a terrorist organization, Saeed. Yeah. I don't think you're having a, we're having a conversation a about what's happening I mean, here. You agree that there's a civilian population in Gaza that is also subject to... Certainly, and the threat, as I mentioned earlier, to civilian populations is of great concern to us, and that's one of the reasons why we're so focused on encouraging all sides to de-escalate. Are you uh, calling on the, someone like Egypt to intervene, perhaps, and can bring about some sort of quiet? We've, again, been in touch with countries from the region. I'm not going to get into any greater level of specificity. Uh, have you gotten a response from the Egyptians that they are willing to intervene? I'll let countries speak for themselves. Do we have more on this issue? Okay. Should we move on to a new topic? Bahrain. Bahrain. Um, I, I don't know. Can you update us on the um, L'Affaire Malinowski? Sure. Um, I believe we sent this out, but in case you didn't all see it, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the meetings that he had on the ground. Um, he arrived on July 6th, and that, and that uh, evening uh, he uh, briefly attended the Wifak uh, Ramadan gathering which was open to the public. Throughout his visit, he was also scheduled to attend the Ramadan gatherings of a pro broad spectrum of society, uh, as is traditional. He also met with the Minister of Interior and Police Chief uh, with the National Institution for Human Rights. Uh, he had meetings uh, scheduled over the coming days uh, with the Crown Prince, Pr First Deputy Prime Minister and Director General of his office, the Foreign Minister, the Minister of Justice and Islamic Affairs, the Minister of Interior Ombudsman, the Commission on Prisoner and Detainee Rights, and the Chief of the Public Prosecutor Special Investigative Unit. So as was noted in the statement we sent last night, this was a trip that was prior planned that we'd worked uh, with the government uh, on. Um, he uh, held meetings internally at the embassy today, and he's scheduled to leave today as well. Uh, to our knowledge, uh, the government of Bahrain has not changed its position. How, how, how long had he planned to be there? He had planned to be there uh, about through the end of the week or through later okay. this week. And he will leave today or has let get late there? I don't know. He's what scheduled to leave today. I'm not sure exactly right. with the time change if he's departed but yet. Will he have had all the meetings that he planned? Or no, he will not have. Not. Um, uh, the Bahrainis um, complained, and you, uh, you had rejected this, but the Bahrainis complained that he was only meeting with one, so, so, uh, one, one sect or one sector wasn't meeting with everyone, and that's not conducive to their attempt at dialogue. Um, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the head of that um, in Saudi Arabia, has also has expressed the same has expressed the same thing. Are you concerned that this incident um, is going to affect not just your relations with Bahrain, but also with the broader Gulf, including Saudi, who you've already had a some somewhat strained uh, relationship? Uh, we're not. Obviously, we remain and will be in t close touch with both the government of Bahrain and any other country that expresses a concern, as would be normal uh, protocol and process. As you mentioned, but it's worth noting, um, he was scheduled to meet with high-level government officials and, and, all, uh, and had, had had some of those meetings uh, before uh, all of these events happened uh, just yesterday. Uh, but uh, no, that's not a concern that we okay. have. Okay, Assistant Ma Secretary Malinowski, in a tweet, which was then retweeted by the State Department, said that this was not about him. This is rather about the Bahraini authorities trying to undermine dialogue and national reconciliation. Um, is that the position of the, of, of the administration, of the State Department, that the Bahraini government is not interested in a di dialogue and national reconciliation? Well, we spoke at great length in detail about this yesterday now. Obviously, it's important for all sides, including the government of Bahrain, to move forward on the reconciliation process, but I don't think I'm going to have anything to add to the tweet you referenced. So, uh, so, so d did the retweet by the State Department constitute an endorsement of, uh, of Assistant Secretary Malinowski's <laughs> stance? I, I wouldn't take it that way. Okay. Have, have there been any conversations between Ambassador and the Bahraini government about something which this building considers highly irregular? We have been in close touch with the government of Bahrain. I don't have any other specific meetings to detail for you. How will, how will you respond to this move, to this step? Uh, well, we're considering our response to the government's decision, but again, it, obviously this is new yesterday, so I don't have anything to outline when, in that regard. When can we expect this response? I can't predict that for you, unfortunately. 
what, when he leaves, is he coming back here, or does he have other stops in the region? Uh, that's a good question. I believe he's coming back to Washington, but we can double check and make sure that's the case. Well, is he, uh, he was scheduled to leave today. I'm not sure with the time change if he's departed yet. So his last meeting, just I'm checking, his last meeting was this with this group that they said that it's not desirable to meet them? Uh, well, he had uh, meetings uh, yesterday also with the uh, Minister of Interior and Police Chief uh, and the National Institution for Human Rights, as well as uh, the, the, the WIFAC leaders. Um, but he had meetings with the government as well as, obviously, members of the opposition. And if you can clarify, I'm not sure if it's clear or not, the reason that it was the meeting or that they asked for somebody to attend the meeting and you refused to, to let them in? Well, um, uh, as he was scheduled, um, th there are a couple of reasons, and we outlined this a bit in our statement, but the government of Bahrain did request to have an MFA representative in all of his private meetings with civil and political society leaders, including inside the U.S. Embassy, and that's not typical, it's not appro appropriate in our view, and it contravenes international diplomatic norms, um, but there have been a range of meetings that officials have had within the country where that wasn't requested. So that certainly isn't even consistent with what is standard there. What I'm, what? The, the, the statement last night, I believe, said that they demanded, they insisted. It was, it was more than a request, right? Or well, did, did, what, did, did the interior or foreign ministries have someone present in these meetings? Or were they rejected? Well, uh, not that I'm aware of, Matt. Obviously, there are some meetings where it's appropriate and some where it's inappropriate. I don't have a list of the uh, who was at each of the meetings, but certainly having, requiring it or insisting or demanding whatever you want to use as an adjective that they be in meetings is something we didn't feel. Sorry, Verb. Sorry. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, there Go is ahead. another question related to the same issue. Usually these meetings, I think it's pre-scheduled and pre-arranged mm -hmm. and pre-organized with the authorities, whatever they are going. Is that was the case here? Or that meeting was like at the last moment was scheduled and then take, take play, took place? Uh, this is a visit that was um, highly coordinated with the government. and With all the details, including the meeting well, of this Well, it's certainly group. pretty standard that the secretary does, and a range of high-level officials meet with a range of groups, civil society leaders, when they go to almost any country. So uh, it was very highly coordinated with the, the government. The reason that I'm asking is that just to be sure that the, the Bahraini government was aware that the assistant secretary is going to meet this group, right? Well, I think there was a discussion about his agenda. I don't have uh, the list of exactly the meetings they were aware of, and some of these come together on the ground, but certainly uh, we've had government officials meet with these groups before, um, so there's a, a long precedent. I haven't heard an absolution on this, but how unusual is it to have... <laughs> how unusual is it to have a host government insist and that's the language in the statement from last mm -hmm. night, that one of its representatives be allowed to attend private meetings that a visiting U.S. official would be carrying out. Well, it's highly unusual, um, and in our view it's also inappropriate and contravenes international diplomatic norms. So given that Assistant Secretary Malinowski was simply visiting, mm -hmm. how does the U.S. respond in this sort of situation? I mean, you know, normally when there's a PNG situation, there's usually a diplomat or two in residence who was then told, pack your bags, you have 48 hours or whatever. How do you respond in something like this to make it clear to the Emirate that this is not permissible? Well, we're considering our response to the government. Obviously, this just happened in the last 24 hours, so I don't have a prediction of the timing or the outcome of that at this point. Is there a concern that the U.S. has to proceed carefully because of the presence of the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain? Well, certainly our strong relationship with Bahrain is uh, something that we would like to maintain, but obviously we're considering a range of options with that in mind. Jen, how, how do you... Does the range of options include not uh, maintaining a strong relationship with Bahrain? No, I don't think I said that it did, Matt. Well, but obviously there are, uh, of course, uh, our response, uh, there's a, a range of options we can consider with that it, in mind. It, it, do, do any of those options have to do with moving the Fifth Fleet? No, that's not what I said, Matt. I know, I know you, I know, you I'm have just, an obsession with no, no, the Fifth I, Fleet, I, I know, but <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not saying that you said it. I'm asking if 
I was actually trying to convey quite the opposite, that our strong relationship with Bahrain is, a, is of course, something that we consider and something we want to maintain, and that's one of the reasons that we're, convey, we're having these conversations through diplomatic channels. So, in other words, maintaining your strong relationship with the government of Bahrain is equal to or more important than them respecting human rights and working towards national reconciliation. It's all a factor, Matt. Obviously, we raised human rights issues as, at every opportunity, and certainly we've expressed our strong concern about <coughs> the events of the last 24 hours. Would it be hours. fair to consider the uh, presence of the Fifth Fleet as a uh, bargaining tool or I'm as any sort of leverage? Uh, no, I'm not speculating on that. Obviously, we uh, consider considering our response. This just happened in the last 24 hours, but I wouldn't go down that, uh, that direction, Raz. So expressing your concern is about you know, the, the, the limit of your language and, and sort of... Uh, you know, expressing this, your displeasure with this act? Can't you say that we are, you know, outraged, we are I annoyed, we are, you know... I don't know if you saw our statement last I night, Sayyid, but it was a pretty strong statement in terms of our, uh, our view of the circumstances over the last 24 hours. Uh, that remains the case, and we've conveyed that privately, and we'll continue those discussions privately, and we'll... Uh, continue to consider our response otherwise. Well, you, it, it was a pretty strong statement when it comes to statements about Bahrain, that's for sure. But deeply concerned is far bit different than we condemn or we, you know, uh, are mortified or we are horrified or whatever. Um, <clears throat> is, that, is that correct? I mean, I, I take your point, it was a strong statement, but it was a strong statement as related to other statements about Bahrain. I, I would also point you to the fact that I just said that their requests were inappropriate and contravene international Fair norms. Enough. So, Fair enough. Margaret, do you want to go to um, Afghanistan, Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. if we could? Um, with other statements that came out yesterday, uh, beyond expressing gravest concern, which I think was the phrase in the statement, mm -hmm. Uh, last evening, can you tell us what the U.S. is doing to try to resolve the standoff on the ground? Well, um, first, and I know you've seen some of these readouts, but uh, President Obama, Secretary Kerry, as well as uh, S. Rep. Dobbins, Ambassador Cunningham have been speaking with the candidates, uh, the electoral bodies, and Afghanistan's political leadership over the past couple of days to try to come to a resolution. And Secretary Kerry has been in touch with both candidates, President Karzai, over the course of the weekend, uh, and I expect that will continue. Um, and we've been, and as was noted in our statement uh, last night, or some we've issued over the last couple of days, um, we're calling on both campaigns and their supporters to work towards a resolution which will produce a president who can bring Afghanistan together and govern effectively and avoid steps that undermine Afghan national unity. And clearly, uh, our engagement uh, shows uh, our a level of commitment uh, to not just um, the future of Afghanistan, but to, uh, you know, a resolution to this issue. In the state, one of the statements yesterday, there was also the, uh, I mean, the threat is what it appeared to be, but the mention that at risk here is a tremendous amount of aid and potential other forms of U.S. support. What exactly was that referencing? Well, it's not our preference. It's not the preference of the United States. It's certainly not the preference of the Afghan people. Uh, that statement was in response to the fact that there have been reports uh, on the ground of plans to declare victory, uh, to create a parallel government. Uh, both of those steps would be illegal. Uh, and it's not a threat, it's a fact uh, that certainly uh, we wouldn't be able to provide the kind of support that it is our preference to provide uh, if those type of steps uh, were taken. So it was conveying that. Because it would be a coup, essentially. Well, those are illegal steps, and obviously we're talking about a broad range of assistance that we uh, provide. So, 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 so if, the, <laughs> if there were illegal steps taken to form a new government in Afghanistan, they would lose aid, but not in Egypt, huh? Matt, every circumstance is different, right. and you know where we stand on know, that particular issue. Do you regard, does the administration regard the steps that um, candidate Abdullah has taken already just by declaring himself the winner of the election, even though he didn't name him, hasn't tried to form a government. Are those, uh, is that a, isn't that a step that undermines the, what you called the, uh, what you called Afghan national unity and what one might say, one might ask if Afghan national unity actually exists given the situation, but, but is that the kind of step that you think is bad? Just well, certainly, uh, I want to say acting on that step, yes. And one of the reasons the Secretary has been in close touch and we issued the statement last night is to convey 
um, that that is not uh, acceptable. The, what, sorry, sure. which is unacceptable? The, the, the proclaiming oneself the, the winner? Correct. There are proper entities and bodies in Afghanistan who will okay. uh, who can determine that. And this also, um, cre the, the, the rumors or reports that there were plans to create a, a, right. a, a parallel government. But what is that? Is that, 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 that is a strike against Abdullah Abdullah in your butt. Now, I'm not saying that there are three strikes. I'm not saying anything like that. But that is a, 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 that is a check mark on him. He's done something that you think crosses the line. No, I wouldn't state it that way at all, Matt. Obviously, we're concerned about having uh, about uh, the fact that Afghanistan has made tremendous progress. Uh, we want to preserve that. that. Uh, any of these steps, the implementation of them, would not be good for the future of Afghanistan, the future of the Afghan people. We're not doing a day-by-day -day grading system here, but certainly we don't think that would be a productive step moving forward. Is, is the uh, Aghani agreeing to the audit of, I think it was like 3 million votes or something, um, is that something that's a step in the right direction? Well, we think there are two things uh, that need to happen here that need to ha uh, that the candidate, that needs to happen on the ground, I should say, moving forward. Um, the Electoral Commission and the Complaints Commission need to examine all of the allegations of fraud. There are serious allegations. They need to be uh, looked into. Uh, and there needs to be a review of all the ballots that may or may not be legitimate. There are were the proposal of the couple of options, uh, Margaret, that you referenced, but there are also some UN proposals uh, t uh, that we think uh, the uh, electoral body should be working with them on. Um, and at the same time, uh, the candidates and their supporters need to be in conversations uh, with each other about the formation of a government of national unity and a government that includes all of the relevant parties and important groups. And we feel both of those steps are important moving forward. Has anyone been in touch with the Ashraf Ghani? Ladies first, Saeed. Yeah. You're course. normally so polite. Go ahead, Rob. just said that he <laughs> called her. He called her. Okay. Uh, Senator Inhofe told reporters a short time ago that he's very concerned about these allegations of fraud, and he started reading off some numbers about vote disparities between the first round and the second round, 10 times, 12 times, you know, the gap in the first election to the second election. He's also very concerned that efforts to hew to the July 22nd final declaration may be stacking the, the victory in Connie's favor, and he wants to see more time so that these allegations of fraud can be fully explored. Otherwise, Enhoff is arguing, whoever becomes the new president won't be considered credible. Does this building, does this administration share his concern about a rush to declaring someone the president? Well, we, uh, one feel there are serious allegations that of fraud that need to be looked into. And we were uh, disappointed, and I know that Matt asked this question yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, that the IEC went ahead with yesterday's announcement. Um, serious allegations, because these serious allegations uh, were not sufficiently uh, investigated, and we would have preferred uh, that the announcement be postponed until there was agreement on further audit measures mm -hmm. uh, that need to be taken to address the substantial allegations. Uh, all of that being said, um, there are proposals on the table um, that uh, would help to address that. Our view remains that uh, the audit process can be completed in time to allow the inauguration of the next president uh, to proceed as scheduled on August 2nd. Is there concern, and maybe this came up yesterday, is there concern that a resolution on the BSA could be in jeopardy because of this dispute over who was the actual victor? Well, again, we view we feel that an audit can be completed um, by uh, an audit process can be completed in time to allow the inauguration of the next president. As you know, both candidates have made clear that they would sign the uh, BSA. We're proceeding with our planning accordingly. Did you, um, you say that you were disappointed that the IEC went ahead with this and that you would have preferred that they had waited. Mm -hmm. um, was that conveyed to the, um, to, um, the, the IEC itself? Uh, I believe not through the secretary, but, but I believe on the ground in some capacity, yes. Okay, so in fact, you, the U.S. has been involved in, uh, in this process. Well, not exactly. I mean, I think obviously there's a, we're not involved in the process of considering allegations or considering 
um, uh, or counting ballots, uh, that's what I'm referring to. But certainly, when there's a partial result announced, which we've expressed a concern about because it right. doesn't represent or doesn't necessarily represent the outcome, that can cause confusion, and that right. was one of our concerns. Right. Okay. But I'm just trying to get it. So if you expressed your concern about that to the IAC, they clearly didn't listen to you. They clearly didn't buy it. It's a bit like calling for restraint from people who never show, show restraint. So I'm just wondering, are you, when you say that you're disappointed, are you dis you're disappointed that they didn't heed your advice? You're disappointed that, uh, disappointed at what? That they went forward with yesterday's announcement when there were serious allegations of fraud that remained on the table that hadn't been uh, properly investigated. Okay, but you still think, as you said before, I just want to make sure, that there is time enough to resolve all the fraud complaints, inaugurate a new president, get the BSA signed by the time you all and NATO have to figure out what you're going to what yes. you're going to do. Okay. Afghanistan? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I mean, I'm trying to understand who is who is who is both sides are ready to make this count or recount process because one of them is declaring that he is the victor and the other one is saying that I'm going to make a parallel government. Who who in those two sides or other sides is ready to continue the process? Till they come to the second of August. Well, we'll let them speak for themselves. Uh, okay, I, but I, obviously, the um, the not the candidates, but the election uh, commission uh, and the complaints commission are the ones who would look in. The complaints commission specifically is the entity that would look into the allegations of fraud and examine those allegations. So you believe, as you and I said, believe that they they want you want them to recount the process, right? Well, there recount are serious allegations, and we think. Uh, that more can be done, done to in, examine the allegations. Keeping in mind mm -hmm. this country's own uh, special experience with uh, the 2000 election, mm -hmm. what would be an acceptable audit, and I'm using your word, for reviewing these uh, allegations? Well, there have been a number of proposals put out there. There have been some that the uh, Complaints Commission and the Electoral Commission have referenced. Margaret referenced those a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but there are also some proposals put forward by the UN. We think they should all talk about the best way to move the process forward. So, just to clarify, the US and UN and others believe that this process has to be done, right? Is, um, am, I, am I correct or wrong? We think there are serious allegations of fraud. They need to review all of the ballots that may or may not be legitimate. So, who? Two weeks from today? I would stand by what I just said. We feel there is enough time to conclude an audit process by that time. Go Change ahead. Change topic. Okay. P5 plus one. Yeah. Uh, France uh, Foreign Minister uh, said today that differences in approach between some of the world powers and Russia had appeared in the last few days during negotiations over Iran's uh, nuclear program. Do you feel the same or do you have the same feeling uh, as uh, France? Well, uh, as you know, there. Uh, this is a long process that's been ongoing for more than six months now, and there have been concerns expressed in the past, actually the last round we had mm -hmm. uh, by France, and uh, the P5 plus one remains united through the process. We certainly uh, believe that that will be the case here. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that significant gaps remain uh, with Iran. Everyone is working very hard to see if we can get uh, to an agreement here, and we've put on the table a reasonable, verifiable, and easily achievable proposal uh, that can show the world uh, that Iran is committed to what it means, and that it, and and uh, and that means a peaceful program and preventing them from uh, acquiring a nuclear weapon. So we're in the middle of it right now. Um, uh, so I don't have much more to speculate. Did, on. did you mean that uh, the U.S., uh, Europe, and uh, Russia are still on the same page? And China, yes. And China. Uh, the talks are continuing. Obviously. Uh, we never said this would be easy, um, and that certainly is the case now where gaps remain in the discussion. Is the Secretary planning to attend the, the uh, meetings in Geneva and uh, Vienna? Well, the Secretary is always happy to get on a plane, as you all know, and many of you have experienced it, um, but uh, there hasn't been a decision made at this point in time for him to travel well, to Because Vienna. the French Foreign Minister has uh, said that the United States wanted Foreign Minister to, uh, to join the negotiations in Vienna, that means uh, maybe he talked to the secretary and... Uh, well, there are a lot of rumors on the ground, as there always are uh, around negotiations like these, but we evaluate day to day. I have nothing to announce for you, and there hasn't been a decision made at this point in time. I know that the answer is going to be that if you, you re 
remiss not to ask it, and okay. that is, would you would you expect the secretary to uh, bring his case for uh, an on Afghanistan to the candidates in person any time in the near future? I have nothing to announce in regard to upcoming travel beyond his trip in China that's ongoing. Uh, Somalia, uh, there is an attack today on the presidential election uh, on the presidential uh, presidential uh, palace. Do you have any information about this attack? I don't have any new uh, information. Uh, I know it just happened, I believe, this morning or yeah. overnight. Uh, obviously, we would um, condemn. Uh, that attack, but let me circle back with our team post briefing and see if we have more details. I'm not sure if there's been any claims or anything along those lines. Okay, Scott. Does the United States have a on China? Mm -hmm. uh, does the United States have a view on Chinese authorities preventing some Uyghur civil servants and students from observing the Ramadan fast? Well, uh, we are deeply concerned by reports of discrimination against and restrictions on ethnic and religious minorities in China, including Uyghurs, especially during the holy month. Of Ramadan. Uh, we urge Chinese authorities to take steps to reduce tensions, uphold China's international commitments to protect religious freedom and other universal human rights, uh, and certainly uh, observation of religion is one of them, and we uh, and reassess counterproductive policies uh, in the region uh, and other ethnic areas. Is it your understanding that this is not the first time that this has happened in that area? I believe there um, is some uh, history here. Uh, I don't have that in front of me, but certainly we've been expre expressed concern uh, about uh, discrimination against uh, Uyghurs in China, and I know uh, that's been related to uh, you know religious observations as well. I want to ask you if you have uh, to clarify what the Russian uh, foreign ministry is saying that one of its citizens was kidnapped by by the American. Can you clarify that? Uh, I think uh, you're. Referring to reports Roman, of allegations uh, of, allegation, yes, yes. Uh, it's You're a saying that he was kidnapped from the Maldives. Uh, it's I, I, I just want to make sure I'm referring to the same person. Hopefully, there's only one incident you're talking about. You're talking about the Department of Justice case that's been raised. Well, they, they said that one of their citizens, Roman Silzianov, was kidnapped from the Maldives by American agents. Well, I know there have been obviously there's been a recent case uh, that uh, I would point you to the Department of Justice on. I'm not sure if this is exactly the same case or not, Said. Uh, in terms of allegations that have been issued, certainly no kidnapping took place. So you mean there's been more than one incident? I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. I'm not sure what he's referring to. The, the, the specifically. That's that's the issue. Okay. Okay. The son of the member of par son of a member of parliament. Yes, yes. from the Maldives. Been taken to Guam. Right. Yes. Have you gotten a official, so any kind of a protest from the Russians about this? They've been thinking about it publicly. I know they've spoken a great deal about it publicly. I don't have anything privately to uh, lay out for all of you. Okay. Well, do you know how it works in terms of like a consular access when you're when when someone is in Guam? I mean, you're still obligated to. It's not like Guantanamo, right? I even a, though it's it the a first US three territory, yes. first three letters are the same, but. <laughs> I think good. the airport code is probably different. It may so, be. We can look but that up. Is there is there some some kind of one of the things that the Russians say or the, the father of this guy says is that he suspects that his son was taken to Guam because people in Guam may not be may not enjoy the full full legal protections that, and I'm just wondering if you know if that if I don't expect you to know if that's a case. I know it's a DOJ thing. But in terms of consular access, I would expect the State Department, even if you don't know off the top of your head, but the State Department might know. Is there some difference in terms of consular access versus someone who's being detained in Guam as opposed to some place that's Not that a I'm state? aware of, Matt. And let me just reiterate, and I think part of the confusion is I also referred to a woman, so I just wanted to make sure we're talking about we're talking about the same individual. But I think we are, right? This we're is, about the same. Yes, I believe so. Uh, but computer, this is computer fraud this is a depart. Yes, there were accusations made. It's a Department of Justice case. Certainly, there was no kidnapping involved. Um, I believe that uh, certainly U.S. territory would abide by the same consular access okay. obligations. Uh, we can check and uh, confirm for you that but that is the case. I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe kidnapping is a bit too strong. But if someone is in the capital of the Maldives trying to get on a flight to back to Russia, and somehow they're spirited away and they end up in Guam, charged with a crime, how, you know how 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 is that not abduction? 
I'm just not going to have much more on this case to offer, Matt. Do so we have a new topic? Yeah, if, with mm -hmm. your indulgence and my colleagues, of course, I just sure. want to go back to the Gaza issue mm -hmm. for a minute. Okay. Because the Israelis said this, this will take, uh, it's a, it, it will take days, not, not hours. So this may go on for a long time. Is that okay with you? I mean, is, is Israel within its right to conduct this operation for as many days as it deems appropriate or necessary? Said, I'm, I'm happy to indulge you as always, but I'm not going to speculate. Obviously, our focus is on uh, communicating the need to de-escalate the situation on the ground, but I would reiterate um, that we believe Israel has every right to defend itself, and certainly no country would be should be expected to stand by while rockets are uh, impacting and uh, threatening their citizens. In light of uh, calling 40,000 reservists to duty, are you concerned that there may be a ground invasion? I think I've already addressed and exhausted okay. this topic. Um, go ahead in the back. My name is Jason Chang, a young news agency from South Korea. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, my question is, you said yesterday that the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula will be one of the key topics for the strategy mm -hmm. talks with China. And what kind of specific outcome do you hope to see from the meeting with regard to this issue? And my second question is, uh, U.S. has been uh, negative about Chinese plan to set up the Regional Development Bank, AIIB. Mm -hmm. And do you think this will also come up during the strategy talk? Thank you. Well, there are a range of topics certainly that will be discussed that may or may not be at the top of the agenda. Um, you know, in terms of the AIB, um, we believe that um, there is a need uh, for additional public, private, and multilateral development uh, uh, bank uh, su to support infrastructure uh, development. Uh, but we also uh, believe any proposal for a new international development uh, finance financial institution should clearly explain how it will complement and add value to existing institutions. As you know, there's already an existing institution. Uh, that does some of the same uh, work. Uh, and additionally, we believe that any international institution involved in infrastructure investment and development should incorporate high standards of governance, environmental uh, and social safeguards, procurement and debt sustainability that have been established over decades of experience at multilateral development banks. Um, and uh, as you know, there's already um, the ADB, which plays a critical role in regional infrastructure development. So the AI, AIIB, excuse me, um, hasn't doesn't exist yet, and obviously those are the uh, the bar. Uh, that's the bar we believe it should pass. In terms of uh, North Korea, there's been an ongoing dialogue uh, between the United States and China, as well as all of our uh, partners in the six-party process about how to best um, work together to put the necessary pressure on North Korea, but the ball remains in their court to take uh, the necessary steps to abide by their international obligations. But certainly we expect uh, the threat from North Korea, our concerns about North Korea, to be a part of the discussion uh, ongoing on the ground now. Lucas. Yes. Greece briefed the House. I was wondering if you had anything more on that. I believe it's a part of our standard uh, effort to uh, make sure uh, members of Congress are up to date on our thinking and policy and uh, what's happening on the ground. So this is just a routine update? That is my understanding, yes. Was there any coordination with the Pentagon given uh, the Secretary of Defense's uh, briefing this morning? Frequently we have briefings the same day as the Pentagon and or uh, other officials throughout the administration, so that certainly is not uncommon. And as you know, all of these senior officials are in regular meetings together about our policies, so I can assure you there's coordination. Now, you granted that uh, this was closed door and classified, but Senator McCain told reporters afterwards that from his perspective, this administration does not have a coherent policy on dealing with the Islamic State group. Is that a fair criticism? Uh, I think that's a common refrain from Senator McCain, no matter what the issue is. But um, I would say, look, every member of Congress has every right to express their view of what our policies are and what they should be and where they see frustrations or where they support us. And that's the case for uh, Senator McCain or any member of Congress. Um, in this case, I think our policy is fairly clear. Uh, the President has been clear, the Secretary has been clear uh, that we're going to uh, take go after threats uh, where they face us. That includes ISIL and includes other terrorist organizations. But in Iraq, 
Our focus is also on the political process, and that is the only way to have a long-term uh, sustainable and su successful Iraq. So hopefully uh, the continued briefings will help shed some light. Uh, two follow-ups on that. One, has this administration seen any change in Nouri al-Maliki's political posture? Is he doing the work that this administration believes needs to be done in order to make his government more inclusive? Well, our concerns haven't changed, but obviously we continue to encourage uh, all parties to move forward with um, the government formation process. I think you've seen overnight that they have announced that they'll be meeting on Sunday instead of August. Um, so that was a positive step forward. Uh, obviously, uh, we'd like to see that happen and see uh, the rapid, uh, the all, all parties move forward with the uh, rapid creation of a, of a government. And then in terms of uh, confronting the Islamic State group, Senator Graham said that he could not see any scenario in which the Iraqi security forces, Syrian opposition, even the Syrian government would be capable of confronting this organization without the assistance of the U.S. military. In particular, he said he couldn't see this happening without the use of airstrikes. Is this administration in any way contemplating some sort of very active engagement to confront this organization? I'm not going to outline from here uh, what our options may or may not be. Obviously, uh, we have a always have a range of options at our disposal. Uh, those are decisions that for the president to make in consultation with the national security team. Our focus remains on uh, continuing to encourage the rapid formation of the uh, government. Sorry, so you say you have a positive <coughs> well, for them to move up the resumption of that. Well, we certainly welcome the announcement, but I, I won't stop there. We, it will re require right. uh, prompt agreement on a new parliamentary speaker and uh, following uh, that, candidates for president and prime minister in order to have a successful creation or formation of a government. All right. In response to one of the Raza's earlier questions, is, is, I mean, w what are the odds of you ever agreeing with critics who say that the administration's policy is incoherent on any issue? Uh, that's probably unlikely, but we certainly support freedom of speech here in, in the United okay. States. There are people that you're Maliki's fascist allies, and that, in fact, his position uh, may have, uh, in any way, hamstrung your position, so to speak, the administration's position in Iraq in pushing forward some sort of reconciliation type of government. Do you agree with that assessment? I would not, and I'm not sure who the uh, unnamed critics are. There are certainly a lot of unnamed critics out there. Uh, I would say that Deputy Assistant Secretary McGurk has been on the ground for weeks now. There's almost no one in the government who knows Iraq and the political parties and all the leaders better than he does. Uh, and he's been working day and night to uh, move the political process forward. And I'd remind you, he's been meeting with uh, leaders uh, from all uh, from all sects. And it hasn't been uh, just uh, Prime Minister Maliki and his government. Far from it. Uh, he's had a diversity of meetings, and that I expect will continue. Would you say that he's a strong advocate of Mr. Maliki? I would say he's a strong advocate of a stable... Uh, a stable Iraq, and he cares deeply about uh, the future of the, for the Iraqi people. When you are asking all these parties to be part of this uh, process of, let's say, stable Iraq, mm -hmm. what these people are expecting from U.S., I mean, it, guarantor, is like, what, how do you, uh, is, what is the U.S. role in the coming future? I mean, it's going to be like guaranteeing that these people are sitting together or secure the borders, well, it's up to the Iraqi people to make the political choices uh, that they need to to move forward. Uh, at the same time, we have provided a great deal of assistance. We've only expedited that, and we've increased that in recent months. Um, that is part of our effort to support Iraq. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have a stake in a stable Iraq, just like we have a stake in a stable region. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're so committed to uh, the future of what's happening on the ground. But let's say when we are U.S. is providing to the Iraqi army things, people looking to it as if it's so you are supporting Maliki against the others, right? Well, we've provided also some support to the Peshmerga. We have uh, advocated for a united uh, security force that works with all parties, that is uh, united against the shared threat they all face, which is ISIL. And that's the message we've been sending. So there is no U.S. role in the coming future, I mean in the coming Iraq? 
or in, there is a role for it? I'm not sure what you're getting at. I mean, like in 2011 or end of 2012, I mean, it's like it was decided to leave Iraq and come out of it. Now it's getting another involvement, or I assume it's involvement. I, am I wrong? Uh, a little bit. I think we're not considering putting combat troops back on the ground. That's not what is under consideration. We do have a stake in uh, a stable uh, and secure Iraq, just like we have a stake in a stable and secure region. And that's one of the reasons we've increased our assistance. Uh, Iraq will remain a partner, and we're working to address the short-term threats so we can have a long-term successful Iraq. Uh, just the Sure. Uh, on the Central America and the, the um, mm -hmm. migrants. Um, yesterday, in exchange with Elise, we, we, were, we were talking about uh, the, the question about a, U, a potential UN role and um, whether or not these people could be considered refugees or not. There are people with the UNHCR now who are saying that mm -hmm. at least some of these, um, some of these people should be uh, identified as refugees and. Be, uh, be made eligible for resettlement. Is the administration's position? Does the administration believe that the U a UN role in this situation is appropriate or needed? Well, the UN plays a role. I know you you know this, but they play a different role depending on the countries around the world. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're, we have a far different circumstance than, say, Syria. Uh, and in this case, the UN UNHCR has previously conducted monitoring monitoring trips to the U.S. border. Uh, in conjunction with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that should come as no surprise. In terms of how you um, um, label uh, what an individual may or may not be, that's determined through a process run by the Department of Homeland Security where they conduct interviews, and there's an entire process I would point you to them to get more details on. Typically, uh, the UNHCR conducts these interviews in countries where the host government is not capable or willing to conduct these interviews. Um, and obviously, the United States, uh, you know, that's a process that we undergo ourselves. So you do, you do not, uh, you believe that DHS, does, the administration believes that, DA, that, that it is capable of doing this itself and that the, the United Nations is not needed well, to, do so the, to do the screening and the classifying of whether people are refugees I would or not. point you to DHS to see if there are needs that they have, but that's typically how the process works uh, as a standard uh, operating procedure uh, in the United States. Well, I guess I'm doing, so there is no administrative administration, but this is only a DHS position on whether they need help. I'm, I, I guess I'm. DHS oversees a process in uh, the United States, uh, obviously I in the United States. That. I understand would, I, I would point you to them for more detail on how they work with the UNHCR. But you don't, but, yeah, but you're the main, the State Department sure. is the main interlocutor with all those are right. all these UN agencies. But specifically on individuals coming into the United States, as you know, uh, DHS is the point for, uh, for that specifically. Right. But what I'm getting at is that uh, I'm trying to find out if the administration broadly thinks that it's appropriate or necessary for the UN to involve itself in, in this. I, I'll, I'll take it and I'll go to DHS and ask them if, that's, if they're the ones who decide whether that's the case or not. Are, are they? Well, DHS screens children to determine the validity of their asylum claims consistent with our domestic law and international obligations. I'm not right. aware of a role needed right. but for okay. UNHCR, but I just was pointing to DHS because they are better okay. versed on this specific issue. Go ahead, Going Lucas. Back to Iraq, <clears throat> is it realistic or was it ever realistic uh, to expect the Iraqis to form a new government during the holy month of Ramadan? The process, uh, as you know, Lucas, is ongoing on the ground, and they're going to be meeting on Sunday. So I think that answers your question. But sh isn't it a little insensitive on the part of the U.S. government uh, based on the religious obligations of the Iraqi government and Muslims everywhere? Well, it's up to the Iraqis to determine their process. They have determined uh, the timing of their process, and we're simply uh, urging them to move forward as quickly as possible. But, I mean, if, if someone asked the U.S. government to do something over Christmas, wouldn't it uh, be a little unrealistic? I think, Lucas, I think you're uh, forgetting the fact that this is a Iraqi process uh, that the Iraqis run, and we are certainly uh, just here to support them and encourage them to move forward as quickly as possible. Go ahead, Say. Question on Syria. On Syria. On Syria. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied that all chemical weapons are now out of Syria and the possibility destroyed? 
say that, you know the the declaration today, is were... is a, on declared weapons. The OPCW right, right. I mean, remains. They rem weapons. let me finish. They remain a member of the CWC. So uh, obviously the the OPCW will continue to take steps to verify uh, that the declared weapons uh, represent. Uh, the stockpile in Syria. So all the declared weapons have been accounted for? Correct. They 100% have been removed. The uh, issue of the SOC is holding elections, uh, presidential elections mm -hmm. in uh, Turkey. Uh, is there any U.S. representative there or not? Uh, that's a good question. I will check and see. Obviously, we're not, these are uh, internal SOC meetings. Oh, uh, so no U.S. officials will attend. So they're we don't have any officials on the ground. And the situation in uh, Aleppo is deteriorating, and the uh, uh, opposition is warning about the, about the situation there. Do you have anything on this? I'm not in a position to give any ground updates. Obviously, you know we remain concerned about the situation on the ground, um, and that's one of the reasons we're so focused on doing everything we can to address it. Does that, does that concern extend to the fact that the opposition might lose Aleppo, and then they might really have you know, essentially lost lost the battle, well, lost I'm, the war. Well, I'm not going to speculate. Obviously, we're not there at this point, so go ahead. Can I go to Ukraine? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering what you, it looks like um, people, uh, the, the separatists in Donetsk are gearing up for a big a last stand uh, and that the Ukrainian authorities are doing the, doing the same around these last little enclaves in the east, and I'm wondering um, – what, what the administration, if the administration believes that it's once again it's calls for restraint and for uh, and uh, and for minimization of civilian casualties are being heeded by either or both or neither sides. Well, we have remaining concerns about the actions of the Russian separatists. I'd also note that uh, President Poroshenko uh, proposed uh, to hold ceasefire talks with the separatists today in the Donetsk region. Uh, they have not responded yet, and certainly. A peaceful outcome is what would be in the best interest of everyone, uh, in our view. Um, Ukraine, again, has the right to defend uh, their country and their people and maintain common order uh, to the degree they can. So we certainly support them in that effort. And there are, are continued to be steps that Russia and the Russian separatists can take uh, to de-escalate the situation. Um, in terms of uh, either side, um or any of the three sides, two sides, however we want to call this. It um, could. Be, it has three side potential. Right. Go back to a triangle. <laughs> right. But I, let's let's talk the two sides. The U, two sides at the moment: Ukraine and the separatists. Uh, do you have concerns about uh, about reports of uh, large, widespread civilian casualties? Well, certainly. On, uh, we would have concerns, of course, about uh, reports of widespread civilian casualties. And obviously, de-escalating the situation and bringing an end to the violence is, is the step that could end civilian casualties. That's really one of the reasons we're so supportive of the ceasefire effort. Um, okay. But to, to date, do you believe that either or both or neither side has, has shown any inclination to heed the, heed the call for restraint and for, you know, trying to minimize or prevent at all um, civilian casualties. You, you were presented here at the briefing yesterday with some, some, some gr graphic photos. I don't know if they could be authenticated or not, but I mean, are, are, have you expressed concern to, the, uh, to authorities in Kiev and also to the Russians for what, whatever influence they can have uh, with the separatists about things like that? Well, one, I mean, we, in general, the Ukrainian uh, security forces have sought to minimize casualties um, among the Ukrainian po population uh, during their security operation. Uh, there have been uh, numerous reports on, on the contrary to uh, Russian, uh, Russia-backed separatists uh, using privately owned buildings as firing positions. Uh, we've also seen a great deal of um, exaggerated and outright false claims from Russian sources throughout the crisis in Ukraine. So certainly we would encourage all sides to uh, minimize civilian casualties, and we've also seen the Ukrainian government uh, make efforts to do just that themselves. And you have, but you have not yet seen the Russians use their influence with, uh, with the separatists to do the same? Is that uh, That's correct. correct. Uh, and then one more thing on this. Um, uh, the Russian foreign ministry said that uh, the proposal that you mentioned just now from Poroshenko mm -hmm. Was not the, the venue 
is not good. And in fact, I believe some of the some of the separatists or one of the separatist leaders said that venue is no good because it's under the control of Kiev, um, which would seem to be a bit of a stumbling block. When you when you referred to that offer to meet, are you referring to that? Specific offer? Or do you not know? I mean, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, this. I'm not sure which offer they're you think, referring to. You think it's appropriate? You think his his offer should be acted? It should be taken up by. Well, by we're the talking about discussions about the government of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, that what's happening in the country of Ukraine, I should say. So certainly, I think it's appropriate that it could be held uh, in a government building uh, run by the government of Ukraine. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry. In the back, one more. Sorry, guys. I had asked this question before, but haven't gotten a response. It's okay. About the um, European Court of Human Rights, which had upheld a French ban on burkas. Did you get that question? Um, I think we have something uh, on that. I'm happy to send that to you okay, after the briefing. Great, Thank you. Thank you.